Uh, just to let everybody know, I just started the recording for the meeting. Um, and I can go ahead and start with the notice of electronic meeting. Um, this okay, meeting let's, of, let's let's have a couple of words from each of the others so that okay, everybody can sort of know what's going on. I don't know if Lonnie's coming. Yeah, there's Lonnie right there to the right too. Okay, so um, Steve, tell us about your world in Cup ever. Uh, I'm uh, an appointed uh, director with the Cup of Soil and Water, uh, representing all five counties of the district. Uh, I, my farm is actually in the Rappahannock, I mean, I'm sorry, the Ravana uh, uh, Basin. It runs, in, runs into the uh, uh, Lynch River, or Roach River, I'm sorry, the Lynch River is the next one over, it runs into the Roach River. In fact, it's there's like uh, three springs on my property, which are the headwaters of uh, Parker's Branch, which goes into the Roach River. And which goes on down and goes into the Rye Valley at the lower end of Green County. So you're representing the North Fork as well. So that's grand. Yes. Very good. Yes. And the, the, for our other uh, soil and water person, Lonnie, can you say a few words? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. My name is Lonnie Murray. I'm a director on the Thomas Jefferson Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and or else we're adding, I mean, I live in the. Um, in the Whitehall area, um, and my um, and my nearest river is the Mormons River, which of course runs in, into the Ravana. So, you can truly see the, the Mormons from your house, which is great. All right, wonderful, Tony. Where's Tony? He's here. He's muted at the He's moment. At the moment, okay. Sorry, here I am. Um, yeah, I'm Tony O'Brien. I represent the Rivanna uh, District uh, for the Flavanna Board of Supervisors. Um, I live uh, just just off of the uh, Rivanna River there, and um, uh, I have a, a close uh, a close relation in in this meeting here. Bella is my daughter, so uh, I'm happy to be part of this group. <laughs> <laughs> well. Congratulations on that. That's terrific. Now, is your district of where Pleasant Green is on the south side of the James? I mean, of the Ravana there? I'm sorry, say that again, please. Is Pleasant Green in your district? Pleasant Grove. Uh, Pleasant Grove, sorry. Pleasant Grove. Pleasant Grove is part of the um, uh, 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 Palmyra district, I believe. Oh, okay. um, but Ann's point, Pleasant Grove is a, a thousand acre uh, um, uh, old farm that was uh, donated or, or purchased by the county and is now a wonderful park with uh, historical uh, trails and a uh, frisbee golf. So uh, if you're coming through in Pleasant Grove. It's also a great pullout when you're canoeing, which is wonderful. Okay, uh, and our other Savannah person hello, is Marvin Moss. This is Marvin. Yep. Uh, who's this? Go ahead, Marvin. Oh, yes, yes. Mr. Moss, I believe you're not muted on the video Pardon call me? you're on. If you're taking another phone call, we can hear you. Okay, very good. You're open tomorrow, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go okay. ahead and mute I'll him. To pick it up. There you go. <laughs> Just to give him privacy, I muted him, and we can go to other people and come back to him. Okay. Um, Mr. Snook. Um, I'm Lloyd Snook, Charlottesville mayor. Um, just recently appointed by the city council to be one of the representatives to this august body. Excellent. Welcome. And Michael Payne, I see you over to the side there. Yes, I guess I will <laughs> second what Lloyd said. I'm a Charlottesville city councilor, have been appointed to this body. Um, I guess more broadly, I do the uh, uh, Riverview Park in Ravana is one of my favorite places in Charlottesville, and I'm often walking down there, so do really enjoy the area. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. And Mr. Herring. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dale Herring, the at large supervisor for Greene County. I've been part of this group, I guess, maybe for a year now. It seems like it's been about a year. Um, so it's good to see everybody again. Hopefully, soon, um, maybe one day we see each other in person again. Who knows? That's <laughs> right. It's great to see you guys virtually, at least. That's terrific. Now, do we get everybody? And Christine, our 
the queen in charge is for the director of the the TJPDC as well. And very good. Okay, I will. Izzy uh, Bell, I will ask you to read the notice of electronic meeting, please. Okay. Um, the meeting of the Rivanna River Basin Commission is being held pursuant to the Code of Virginia 2.23708.2, which allows a public body to hold electronic meetings when the locality in which it is located has declared a local state of emergency and the catastrophic na nature of the emergency makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And the purpose of the meeting is to provide for the discharge of its lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. This meeting is held via electronic video and audio means through Microsoft Teams online meetings and is accessible to the public with closed captioning. And there will be an opportunity for public comment during this portion of the agenda. Notice has been provided to the public through notice of the TJPDC offices to the media through the RRBC website posting and the agenda. The meeting minutes will reflect the nature of the emergency, the meeting which was held by electronic communication means and the type of electronic communication means by which the meeting was held. A recording of the meeting will be posted at the Rivanna River Basin.org within 10 days of the meeting. Excellent. Thank you. No problem. And I think our next item is the discussion if necessary, correction if necessary, and adoption of the minutes from September 14th. So were there any additions or corrections in those minutes from anybody? And if not, I will ask for a motion to adopt the minutes. So moved. So moved. And I'll take the second one as a second. That's terrific. And all in, oh, and all in favor, please say aye. Aye. <laughs> or wave your hand. <laughs> Thank you. And Jason. No, I abstention <laughs> since I wasn't even on the board then. Very good, thank you. Jason, please introduce yourself to the group. Thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, Jason Halbert. Uh, I'm the executive director at the Oak Hill Fund, a private foundation, and I'm the citizen representative for the city of Charlottesville. Sorry for joining late. We're glad to have you, that's wonderful. And um, it may come up on the agenda later, but I think I remember Isabella, you telling us that, that there's a citizen opening in Albemarle that we need to work on filling, is that correct? Yes, there is also one in Green County. OK, so we have work to do board members to find some people to go to bat with us on this topic. Very good. OK, let me jump back up to my agenda here. And next is upcoming um, schedule. All yes. right, talk to us about that, please. Alrighty, so I did wanted to make everybody aware that um, in congruence with the changes with COVID, um, the next meeting will be held in person. Just so you all are aware, we will be able to see each other face to face coming up here shortly. Um, and the next meeting will likely be um, in September before the annual conference that's held. Um, and just for a little bit of background here, the TJPDC has been working on a work plan for the Rivanna River Basin Commission. You can check out the scope of work um, in the meeting packet there, but at the upcoming meeting, we will um, present the final document, no longer a draft or preliminary recommendations for approval to you all, hopefully. Great. I can go ahead with my presentation here, if that works for everybody. Thank you. This is for item four, the broadband corridor plan presentation. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just start off with a little introduction of myself as well. Isabella, um, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Are you guys hearing feedback from one of the non-video? Um, Mr. O'Brien, I'm going to go ahead and mute you just so you know. I think we're getting feedback from you. Great. Thanks. So you know, I think we're getting feedback. Okay. I will go ahead and share my screen, but I did want to start with just an introduction. Um, are you all seeing the presentation? OK, wonderful. So um, I'm Isabella O'Brien, a new member of the TJPDC. Um, I'm an environmental planner focusing um, mostly on environmental programs. So I support the watershed implementation plan, the solid waste and recycling plan, um, hazard mitigation plan, and the Rivanna River Basin Commission here. Um, as you may have heard from my father, um, I'm from Fluvanna County. I am a Fluvanna County native and then um, went on to UVA to study environmental science. Um, my first internship was actually with the Rivanna Conservation Alliance, so I have a lot of personal interest being involved in this program and I feel really honored to be able to support you all in your efforts here. 
Um, but I will go ahead and jump right into it. So as I had mentioned, we've been working on a, um, a work plan for the Rivanna River Basin Commission to take on in upcoming years. And the stage that we're at right now is we've completed all of our background research. Um, and now we're looking for feedback from you all on if there's any um, recommendations that you don't see addressed that you'd like us to um, sort of explore further as we continue through this process, or if there's anything that you'd like to add to the existing recommendations here. So first, I'm just going to take you through a little bit of the process that we've gone through um, to develop these and then share the recommendations with you all. So um, I thought it was important as a new member of the TJPDC to understand um, in depth the purpose of the Rivanna River Basin Commission. Um, and as you all I'm sure are aware, we provide guidance for the stewardship and enhancement of the water and natural resources within the basin. And we're a forum for local governments and citizens to discuss issues affecting the basin's water quality, quantity, and other natural resources. Um, and then by promoting communication, coordination, and education, and by suggesting appropriate solutions to these identified problems, we um, shall promote activities that foster the resource stewardship of the environmental and economic health of the basin. So um, you can see a little bit more included in the scope of work that I shared in the meeting packet, as well as um, the preliminary recommendations. I made a little document right up there. But our initial research involved um, a review of the policy recommendations and programs pertaining to the Rivanna River. You can see kind of the research that we compiled there um, as well in the meeting packets. Um, we also looked into other river area plans to identify the recurring themes and the best practices of other areas. Um, we also did an inventory and assessment of the many different river, um, the organizations involved along the river, whether it's through um, environmental protection, historic resources, preservation, um, or recreation as well. Um, and then I did a deep dive into the history of the Rivanna River Basin Commission. Um, it was really lovely speaking with Leslie Middleton, the past executive director of the Basin Commission before the merge with the TJPDC. I got a lot of helpful insight there into their successes in the past um, and maybe what we can take from the past and learn from that here. And then um, we also looked into the Rappahannock River Basin Commission, um, which is sort of has a similar role to us um, in the Rappahannock region, except they are a much larger basin. Um, so they'll typically have um, senators, delegates, local government, um, soil and water conservation districts meeting on, on a quarterly basis to discuss um, water quality issues. And um, we actually, our next step is going to be to uh, have a meeting with Eldon James, who is the coordinator there, uh, to kind of get a little bit more insight into the history of what they do as well as um, what makes them successful as a basin commission. Um, and then as we were conducting the inventory and the assessment of the organizations involved along the Rivanna, um, I recognized the opportunity to kind of hear a little bit more from them. Um, so we sent out a survey to um, the organizations we identified in that inventory to kind of gain their insight into the issues um, and goals pertaining to the Rivanna River, as well as the programs that they were involved in pertaining to the Rivanna River, so that whatever we were to recommend for the Basin Commission would complement their work and not be duplicative of it, um, as well as to just gain some insight from the people that are working on the ground there. Um, and then we moved forward with developing a few recommendations and then brought those to um, some local staff and technical experts. Um, I spoke with David Hirschman, who served on the Technical Advisory Committee of the Rap, um, Rivanna River Rap, Basin uh, Commission Rivanna River. in the past. And sorry, was that somebody? I know. OK. Um, and he also is a water resources consultant in the area currently now. We spoke with um, local parks and rec staff, as well as local planners um, to get their insight into the recommendations that we've developed and what the, their priorities were surrounding the Rivanna um, in the development of these recommendations. And then um, again, this is in the meeting packet, but just to show you um, sort of the research that we did, we looked into the comprehensive plans of each locality within the basin and then listed there are some of the other um, river area plans that we were able to research and find the common themes within. 
Um, and through looking at the comprehensive plans of each locality and the city, um, and through speaking with local staff, the we found about seven common threads throughout all of these that I think encompass um, every locality, which is um, increasing recreational facilities, biking and walking paths, encouraging um, tourism, physical health and safety, um, addressing economic development and job opportunities along the river, maintaining um, natural scenery um, and rural scenery, as well as um, conservation easements along the river, maintaining and improving water quality, increasing public education surrounding the river, and then maintaining our historic and cultural resources along the river. And we sort of use this as a jumping off point for developing those recommendations um, there. And once we identified these common threads, um, just to show you a little bit more about the survey that we sent out, um, we asked um, specifically what initiatives they were involved in relating to the Rivanna within sort of each of these buckets of the common themes. Um, and then as there's already an urban corridor plan for Charlottesville and Albemarle, we wanted to get their feedback on what specifically was occurring in the rural areas. Um, just to focus a little bit more on that as there's already been a, a greater focus in the urban areas. Um, and then we just took that opportunity to ask them about the regional challenges and issues that they had addressed along the Rivanna opportunities for better coordination. And then um, any other organizations that they collaborate with that we could um, speak with and contribute to this conversation. And then I just left it open for them to share anything else that they'd <clears> like to do after providing background on what we were trying to accomplish here. Um, and these were the um, organizations and nonprofits that we sent the survey out to. I kind of threw out a wide net here um, just to kind of gather as much feedback as possible. Um, but again, focusing on some of the historical um, and uh, environmental organizations in the area. And some of the feedback that we got was um, they were from the Piedmont Environmental Council. They were looking for um, more implementation of the drinking water supply plan, um, better protection of riparian buffers, better mitigation of impervious surfaces, maintaining compact growth boundaries within the rural areas to um, limit the slow drip of subdivision development. Um, Wild Virginia wanted us to sign on to legislation that impacts water quality, such as the Campaign for Virginia's Water Future, um, as well as to work to stop the permitting of the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Um, as um, the uh, Old Mills Trail is being developed further, <laughs> someone asked for um, us to ease right away on the north side of the Rivanna to facilitate the expansion. And then um, just to explore um, the incentives that exist for implementation of stream buffers and better incentivizing livestock exclusions um, and just in general increased conservation of the watershed lands. Um, and then again, I mentioned this before, but I looked into the history of the Rivanna River Basin Commission um, through conversations with previous staff members and technical advisory committee members and got their feedback on some of the recommendations we were exploring. And then I also got to take a look at some of the documents that were developed um, through the Rivanna River Basin Commission in the past and included in um, the resources that I sent over. You can take a look at the Rivanna River snapshot which was drafted in the past, which was about a 12 page report on just the current state of the basin. Um, the water quality issues, there are organizations that people can collaborate with, um, local um, or native species. And then also I took a look at the state of the basin report, which was developed in 1998. And it actually, it was a huge effort um, by so many stakeholders um, in the Rivanna River Basin Commission that developed about 75 recommendations surrounding the Rivanna. Um, and it was kind of interesting to take a look back at that one. Um, and then, of course, I just reviewed um, our conferences and meetings here in the past to hear um, what issues have been impacting the Rivanna um, in recent years. So now we're getting into um, some of the recommendations that we've developed. 
So first um, would be an annual update to the Rivanna River snapshot. And so um, currently the uh, Rivanna Conservation Alliance provides uh, a technical report every year on water quality in the area as well as native species. And we don't want to step on any toes. So um, I think rather than being a more technical sharing um, information body, the Rivanna River Basin Commission has a unique opportunity to share region-wide information on the successes surrounding the Rivanna River, such as the successful projects, um, such as the um, Moores Creek restoration project that's occurring there in the park, um, as well as um, successful grants, environmental grants that um, organizations have been able to apply for to kind of share region-wide information about successes, as well as how the public can engage with the many river stakeholders um, that we have identified as part of our research process. And this would just be informed by um, local meetings with staff members, local news, um, conversations with the Rivanna stakeholders. And I think it's just a way to um, connect the public as well as localities with the Rivanna as well as um, the successful implementation of best management practices, which is a big part of the um, watershed implementation plans goals for the state. And then the next recommendation um, through conversations with local staff, this was the recommendation that was preferred by them, um, but it would be the Rivanna Roundtable, which would be more so a forum for um, stakeholders surrounding the Rivanna to collaborate. I know we have our annual conference here, but it's more so been, I think, a presentation and there's not really um, coordination of the various river um, stakeholders and stewards to kind of collaborate on their efforts. Um, I know something that was mentioned in um, a past board meeting through um, through the RRBC was that localities are interested to know more about the environmental legislation that they can enforce and ordinances that they can pass to kind of improve water quality standards in the area and something I was thinking we could address through the Rivanna Roundtable by inviting um, speakers from potentially the DEQ or other localities to speak on the best practices there. Um, and this would just really open up a forum for us to collaborate on the goals that have been identified through the many planning efforts that have occurred surrounding the Rivanna um, through, I think, looking at the state of the basin report and the urban corridor plan. There's a lot of recommendations that still stand. And also, even in the urban corridor plan, I'll show you some of the guiding principles there in just a moment. But I think there's a lot of overlap into um, the rural localities and by taking a look at that and um, sort of collaborating on how we can move forward with some of these recommendations, I think that would be very beneficial um, to the community as well as each locality. And um, here are some of the organizations that I was thinking would be helpful to be a part of this roundtable. Um, I spoke with uh, some contacts at the DEQ about this specific recommendation. And in years past, um, there was a grant opportunity available for a roundtable um, surrounding watershed issues, which could potentially support um, this if we decide to move forward and develop it. Um, and that application would likely open up in fall. And as we um, sort of a define specific topics that need to be addressed as the, at the round table, we can make sure that um, the stakeholders there can be a part of this group. So it doesn't necessarily have to involve everyone each time, but um, specific people as needed. Um, and yeah, again, I, I just wanted to show you the guiding principles of the urban corridor plan as I think that there's some overlap with um, the entire Rivanna River and I think having the, the Rivanna Roundtable could help to inform potentially a um, entire Rivanna plan, not just a specific corridor in the future. Um, and then next we have this historical timeline um, of the Rivanna River Basin. 
uh, I found a really cool example uh, from the Noose River in North Carolina, and they have a few different versions of it. So I'll go ahead and just show you those examples. So first here on the right side of the screen, you can see um, sort of their printable version. It was a smaller and more condensed version. Um, and the purpose of this was to familiarize um, the population with their watershed and give context to the specific water quality issues that affect their river basin. And I think that this would be very similar to what um, our goals would be through our historical timeline. Um, and by implementing this, we would likely partner with the local historical societies, Parks and Rec, um, historical nonprofits, the Monacan Indian Nation, and others as identified. Um, so here, I'll show you the other versions that they created. Oh, one second. So first, they have this um, this sort of more interactive version of it where they share specific information on the watershed um, and the brief history. Some of the things that I think would be interesting to include in this for the Rivanna is the bateau history, as well as history of the Monacan Indian Nation, um, the Civil War history, the history of the canals and locks that were used in the past, um, as well as some of the history of development and how that's impacted water quality. So we can work with um, RCA as well as the DEQ to report on some of that information. Um, I'll go back to the presentation here. Um, but the purpose really of that there's there's multiple purposes actually. So as identified in the state of the basin report, um, there's a lot of really unique history that um, surrounds the Rivanna River, but boaters and travelers don't really have readily available information um, to this. And so this would help to support that. Their recommendation regarding this um, this um, that they I don't know <laughs> this uh, comment that they noticed was to ask partnership to develop a series of identification signs along the Rivanna for boaters and walkers and recreational users to um, acknowledge the significant historic sites along the Rivanna. And while I don't necessarily think that that's the Rivanna River Basin Commission's um, purpose here, I think that it could help to inform that if that's something that we wanted to move forward with in the future. Um, and then I was thinking in, in um, in collaboration with this, we could also create a map of the current access points to the river and the historical resources as we identify them, um, which could help to inform the development of signage. But also, um, this could be really helpful to inform grant applications in the future. I I looked into a few in the future, um, few grant uh, opportunities available through the Department of Conservation and Recre Recreation and the Historic Resources and Incentives Grants, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and the Virginia Land Conservation Fund are all available to localities. Some are available, I think, to regions um, where you can help to, or you can um, give funding for the preservation of these historic sites as well um, and conservation easements. And for this one, I think it serves um, three of the goals, or three of the sort of common themes that we identified through our background research, um, where we'll be educating the public on their local history and what makes this uh, area so unique. Um, we'll be sharing information on the historic resources. Oh, but in the education aspect as well, it'll be inclusive of how, how we impact the water quality of the area through development and history. And then also, I think if there's more knowledge of the cultural and historic places along the Rivanna River, this will help to promote um, recreation and time outside as it's become so important um, through COVID. And then um, the next recommendation would be a regional map of Rivanna, Rivanna's blueways. Uh, I know that this was something that you all had spoken on in the past board meeting. Um, that there's really not a regional map of access points surrounding the Rivanna River um, and the trails that um, recreational users can explore. Um, I know specifically in 
Fluvanna County, they have an issue where um, there aren't there isn't a lot of access points along the Rivanna River, which makes it difficult to um, use the river for recreational uses, such as um, canoeing or kayaking, but also makes it somewhat more difficult to do water testing within that portion of the river because um, it takes about eight hours to go <laughs> from one point to another. So that's really a, a big event to plan. Um, and those are all of our recommendations. So what we're really looking for um, from you all is what recommendations you think provide the most value to your locality as well as the larger basin. And if there's any other recommendations that you'd like us to explore or anything that you'd like to build on from the recommendations that we have identified. Stop sharing my screen. And I see Lonnie has his hand raised. You can go ahead, Lonnie. Yeah, so one thing that I think is very important to include is also um, biodiversity resources of rare habitats and species. Albemarle County has done a great job um, with the Natural Heritage Committee, full disclosure, which I also sit on, um, of, of capturing um, our areas that are special sites, of mapping those. We have, um, we have a GIS layer of where those occur. Um, and so um, several times I've passed those along to the, um, to the planning district, but you can feel free to reach out to county staff and get that, that layer again. Um, there's also great tools like iNaturalist that can be used to um, enumerate uh, biodiversity along the corridor. Um, the Albemarle County has a biodiversity action plan that talks specifically about the river um, and critical habitats that exist there. Um, and a lot of things that are said in that biodiversity action plan could very easily apply to, to Charlottesville or, or Fluvanna. Um, you know, the, a lot of those recommendations would, would make equal sense for those, those areas, in my opinion. Um, also, one of your slides, you had something that said, um, what incentives are there for, um, what best management practice incentives are there for uh, residential urban areas? And I can just answer that right now. Um, there is uh, um, the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program is the, the leading program for that. It's administered by the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And there are local additions to that, including um, the Charlottesville Conservation Assistance Program and the Albemarle Conservation Assistance Program, which adds supplementary funds to that, that program. So that's it. Thank you, Ronnie. Yep. All right, who else would like to weigh in with some things? Marvin, I see your hand, go ahead. Christine, is Marvin um, muted from the in in house? No, no, Marvin, can you unmute yourself? Looks like his video has a delay. Also, he might be frozen. I'm sorry. Yeah. Ms. Ramos, are you still Hello. able to hear us? There we go. <laughs> yeah, it looks like there's technical difficulties. We're not able to. The video is going very slow and we're not able to hear him. Marvin, can you um step off and re and sign on again that might help you to clear up whatever that feedback is and while marvin's getting squared away who else has a comment they would like to add to the list of suggestions and and what we what uh, isabel's been telling us about here i have a few but i don't want to take over so i'll give you all a chance to speak up first <laughs> the uh michael Payne. go ahead Steve, go ahead. Steve's waving his hand. Oh, you're also muted, Steve. Steve, you're going to have to go on off mute. Yeah, if you can hear us, Steve, you're still muted.
How about now? That's better. Here we That's, go. Okay. All right. I was just, uh, and in fact, I, I was going to ask Ann if it's okay if I communicate with Isabella to get some background checks on the water quality tests that have been done on the upper Ravana, you know, up towards Green County and in that area. So all this stuff can be accumulated. And and I, I would like to use it as background information on trying to get uh, the landowners and the farmers along the river and the tributaries to do stream exclusions through Culpeper uh, Soil and Water District. So, and I mean, you know, I, I have been, that that is my thing with the water, soil and water district is especially in, in the area where I live uh, and whatnot is to get people to do this. Uh, and it's, you know, we, we long as we're, you know, the uh, district and whatever was paying 100%, we, we did fairly well with it, but now it's not back, you know, they cut it back, but it's, it's coming back towards that a little bit. But especially in Greene County in this particular area, we are having a tough time getting the landowners to do that. Even though the money is available uh, and it's there, people just don't want to get involved. So if, if we have uh, the background data on the streams, uh, the water quality, they've been kind of used uh, to prod them along a little bit, uh, hopefully that'll work. And if, and if I, if, if Isabella can, you know, send some of this stuff directly to me so I can have, I can kind of put it together and whatever and have it available uh, without going through the board per se, is that okay? Yes, that is absolutely okay. okay. I think that we are here to share and convene all information from whatever the source. So I think that's great. I would also remind, I, and somewhere in the PDC files, I because I think David Blunt was actually at the meeting, uh, Nesha McRae from DEQ did have a two-year study on the North Fork of the Ravana, and we had several meetings in Greene County at the library, uh, and quite right. a few, th 30 or so people came, which was wonderful. I so was there. So one of there's, those, some, I know. there's some data from that study yeah. that may be helpful to you even more directly, so I would dig around for that and... Uh, I'm sure Nesha can forward that to you as well. That is terrific. Uh, let's see. Michael Payne, you had your hand up. Yeah, this is, I don't know how much this body, you know, may necessarily engage with this, but this is something we talked about when City Council adopted um, plan for the Rivanna Corridor as part of our comprehensive plan. Um, but partnership with arts organizations um, and really exploring whether there are opportunities with groups like Bridge, Bridge Progressive Arts or others to have art be part of the experience and open it up as a public space in areas of the Rivanna. Um, I think it came up, you know, something like on a probably much, much smaller scale, but something like Asheville's River Art Districts, if there's just any opportunities to create that kind of public space for people along this corridor. Um, that's the only thing that jumped to mind. And then I know it's probably already the biggest priority, but definitely second and echo the, you know, making sure that anything done is not allowing unstructured development to either reduce the water quality or just reduce, um, you know, this natural resource that we have. Thank you. That That's terrific. Marvin, I see your hand raised. Are you able to get connected? Uh, can you hear me now? You can hear me? Yes, go oh, ahead. Great. Okay, several observations. Uh, uh, one, as some of you know, I chaired the very first meeting of the RRBC about the time of the Civil War, and I've been involved with it either as a chair or vice chair or citizen member ever since. Uh, I just have a couple of suggestions. One of the things that, um, that uh, were raised uh, by Isabel when we just got started is establishing a, a map of the Rivanna, we need not uh, reinvent the wheel here. The RCA did exactly that years ago. I have mine right here on the shelf, which identifies all of the natural and historical things to see along the river and uh, gives, uh, I, I, I'm sure that the uh, RCA still has that in their 
file someplace, we update it and uh, 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 not go back to trying to develop something that already exists. Uh, the second thing that I am very concerned about is that the R RBC is playing almost, I, right now I'm chairing the Open Space Committee advising Fluvanna County on its uh, update of its comp plan. And I really believe that the RBC ought to be having more outreach to those of us who are trying to put together uh, amendments to our existing comp how that could be implemented, I'm not sure. But I think one of the things that I think we're not doing is um, emphasizing uh, in our comprehensive plan the importance of the Rivanna River to all aspects of life in our county. Uh, and I think that the RBC could provide us a lot of information that might be in developing a new comprehensive plan. Finally, I just wanted to give you an example of a local success story, which I think ought to be up, up on the RRBC website. Um, we had a developer in Fluvanna County who was about to, on 100 acres of land uh, in the central park of part of the county near the village of Palmyra, our county seat, was going to develop 50 to 60 houses on very steep slopes. Uh, above Ballinger Creek, which is a major tributary in Fluvanna County into the Rivanna. Uh, I was very much opposed to it uh, because I thought it was both an inappropriate site, but also uh, uh, local citizens to their great credit began organizing. And essentially we defeated the effort uh, by the uh, developer to get permits uh, to proceed with the development. How did they do that? They raised 20 some householders around Ballinger Creek, raised over $250,000 to buy the land to create a nonprofit called Tadpole to have the land that they purchased in the process of being put under a conservation easement with the Virginia Outdoors Foundation because it was less than 100 acres, evidently VOF was uh, uh, persuaded to do it. Only Tadpole has already committed to making uh, that into a public access, including a park, a public park, and access to Ballinger Creek, which is just a half a mile from where Ballinger Creek enters the Rabiana River. This is a great success story. I have been in Fluvanna County since 1995. And I have never seen citizen action on in this county uh, uh, to such a level with such an enormous success. And this group now is legally able to hold conservation easements. Fluvanna County years ago with my urging and urging of many others put into effect their own conservation easement program and became very successful. They hold easements on everything from parcels of 16 acres to over 600 acres. They uh, now have almost 2,000 acres under conservation easements where the easements are held by the county. In the last two years, the county has refused any new applications for easements under their program, even though it's still the existing law. Uh, my rural preservation group has just written a letter to the supervisors and the planning commission and others asking uh, them to start up that program again because it's uh, legally still on the books and it needs to be done. We have dozens and dozens of parcels in a county that are ready to go under easement that do not fit the $100, 100, 100 acre uh, uh, minimum with VOF, we need to be able to put that land under conservation easement. We have had a very successful program here in this county, uh, both with historic preservations, which my property is under, and conservation easements. So we need to get the county to restore that program, which we're in the process of trying to get done. Um, but I think the Tadpole uh, group needs to be 
shown to everyone in the entire Ravana Basin, uh, because this is a story that is uh, astounding. I mean, truly astounding. They are in the process now of trying to buy another 23 acres, and they've raised the money to do that, to add to the uh, already 70 some acres that they already have. So um, I can't beat the drum enough for this because I think it's, it's just an absolutely amazing program. Yeah, um, and that's, so that's kind that's, of what I was hoping to promote through the update of the Rivanna snapshot by just sharing information on how these successful process or projects occur in each locality for other localities to learn how they can implement them as well as for the public to understand how they can implement some of these best practices as well. It could also be a really good topic or share for the Rivanna Roundtable is bringing success stories and sharing it more broadly against all of the dis different stakeholders, including the, the one that Mr. Halbert put in the, the chat. That would be great for others to hear about the success that Oak Hill Fund has had. And I think the same amount of work can be used in multiple ways because there will be people who can't attend the roundtable who might come to the conference, the one day, two hour thing and others can see it on the website later. So I think making sure that we have not just a single shot, but a, Scott, a shotgun shot to get this information out as broadly as possible is really terrific. I had written down with the conference things a look back, and it could be just a quick photographic look because um, some number of years ago, Marvin will help me with the year, maybe eight years ago, uh, the commission got a, or maybe 10 years ago, the commission got a NIFWIF grant and did a major stormwater project in each jurisdiction. And so the sort of before and after pictures, the one in green is near the park uh, in, in Albemarle. We put in a constructed wetland in Crozet to help <laughs> clean the water between the old lots and where there's no room for stormwater now and the Lick and Hole Basin. Uh, something in Flavanna, I can't remember, it was at Pleasant Grove, I think, and uh, Charlottesville had the renovations along Moore's Creek that were founded, I think, by TNC, I think. Um, so that's another way to very, in a quick snapshot, be able to show here's what we had and here's what we have now. And you can do this too. And uh, so that's just another thing that could be added in there. Um, let me zoom back. I had a couple of things that I wanted to get other people's feedback on. When you were talking, Isabella, at the very beginning about the common themes that you had uh, pulled from all those different jurisdictions and reports, what I would ask you to think about adding what was talked about for the Rivanna Corridor Plan, which is the more urban section, there were a whole bunch of things that everybody wanted, but the number one thing that the entire group said had to come first was environmental quality, environmental protection. And after that, then if there was access that could happen but didn't, have an environmental negative impact, then it could go forward, that kind of comparison. So there's the first threshold and then other things could happen along. And I just want to reiterate that for uh, for this. It would also be fun to, because I don't know the numbers, but uh, someone talking about um, Rappahannock County and how they're putting a lot of easements in up there and that the Rappahannock River Basin provides drinking water for several million people. And I don't know how many people are in the drinking water basin for the the Rivanna and the James, but I would sure like to try to figure that out because I bet it's a pretty big number and that's sometimes a way to get people's attention. Um, talked about Nesha's. I, I feel Steve Morris's pain about getting farmers to sign up because even when it was 110%, if you added on the cost of the 10-year CREP rental, they still didn't want to do it because they just don't want to do it. But eventually, these things are going to be mandatory. So I keep saying to people, wouldn't it be good if you did this when you could actually get paid for it instead of when you have to? So please don't wait too long. I um, believe, Ann? Yeah. I believe uh, there's a law. I'm not certain if it's been passed or not. But if we don't meet the Chesapeake Bay criteria by 2025, okay. then stream exclusion will be mandated by the state if you have animals. Right. 
So it's coming. And they got it postponed for five years because it was supposed to take effect in 2020 and the legislature po- booted it again. But having booted it three times, hopefully they won't be able to boot it again. And so that's absolutely a good point to remember when you're speaking to neighbors is that the end is coming, folks, and it's time to do to do right. And it's remarkable how quickly the difference happens. I mean, within six months, we it took us 20 years to get our various fields done because of the expense. But mm. the uh, within six months, the banks had healed themselves when we didn't have the 1500 pound animals stomping up and down all the time. And uh, when we had the enormous flood in May 29th of 2018, we had 11 and a half inches of rain on our place in six hours. And it was horrendous. And our entire fence out was six feet underwater. So there were no posts visible of the fences or anything. All the trees lay down flat. But because we had had 10 years of healing before that, there was so much less destruction than we could have had. We had a lot of destruction that came in from upstream from other properties that had not been stabilized that then had real huge impacts to our lake and spillway and bridge, et cetera. But I was so impressed with the way the stream, the buffers had made such a difference and saved us a whole lot of pain and expense. Um, the Marvin uh, talked about the outreach to existing comp plans. And I do remember that before the storm was a, a multi-jurisdictional effort that was done in the 2009-10 era, a whole RCA and SELC, other organizations in the UVA department all worked together. And they looked at the things that each of the jurisdictions could do, whether it was changing the sizes of parking places or not having so much parking required to therefore reduce the permeable, the impermeable surfaces. Uh, and this was all affecting how we would deal with stormwater. So that document is live and well. I can get the um, digital copy to anybody who needs it. And it's probably posted on our website somewhere, but that's sort of another resource. As Marvin mentioned, we want to make sure that we hang on to the things and dig up the things that were already done to bring them to life again. And I have several copies of that two by four foot RCA map that are just spectacular. They're they're so big, it's hard to display unless you have a big, big stand up place. But maybe getting that whole thing put into signage would be good. Um, I'm going to try to make sure I didn't forget something here. Um, so I the oh and someone mentioned about rural issues because we've talked a lot about the um, the more urban sections because there was a little extra funding to do that. But for the rural components, I know that the those jurisdictions had already you know put in their amounts for the. Um, you know, for supporting the commission and there were studies to be done to benefit them as well. But what I hear from people is erosion and stream banks that when we get these flash flood uh, events, the tree falls that are being pulled down because of the bank erosion, and then those trees are slamming into bridges or getting dragged down to the reservoir. It just really shows how we need to concentrate on stream bank stabilization for um, mitigation of future floods all the time. Um, and OK, we talked about that. Zooming down the list here, uh, the Albemarle Historical Society, I think, would be a tremendous asset. Fran Lawrence has rooms full of information about the historic and cultural things along the river that I'm sure we can lean on him to share and digitize and and get that information going. So. While I think there are three PhD dissertations in what Isabella had shared with us that was possible, I think there are a lot of partners who can give us a lot of information already. And I think you, Isabella, you were hoping that we would think of one of these projects to do first. Is that a today discussion, or do you want us to think about it and get back to you for in September? How do we, how do we refine our discussion going forward here? Yeah, um, I mean, I would love to hear back from you all what you think provides the most value to the locality and sort of what we were thinking is potentially these could build on each other um, in a three to five year work plan um, as we continue forward. 
but uh, feel free to reach out to me afterwards if there if you want to take a deeper look into the resources that I provided um, or if you have any other thoughts that come up um, as you review this information and I know that Jason's had his hand up for a while so let's oh, go sorry. ahead and look at him. Mr. Cotta, Mr. Cotta. Oh that's kind of a reference. <laughs> the sorry. old people get that but the young people don't. Um, uh, yeah so I know that the I think the largest grant the Basin Commission's ever gotten was a NIFWIF grant and that Dan talked about, and there hasn't been any for a number of years. Um, there are a number of new funding streams, whether it's through the Infrastructure Fund, the Chesapeake Wild, or new earmarked federal funds for NIFWIF. They are flush with cash, and a lot of that will be going to the Chesapeake Bay. So let's bring home some bacon to all of our counties in the city um, in a coordinated fashion. I, I don't think NIFWIF would look favorably on a number of uh, disparate requests, whether city here, Flavana here, they would look to us, this commission to say, hey, why aren't you coordinating some of this and prioritizing what needs to happen? So I'm happy to meet with Isabella and whomever else to try to um, get a handle on both the NGO side and the government side about who's thinking of, what are the deadlines, and how does it fit with our priority prior to prioritize the list um, and see how it meshes with the funding streams? Because that to me is the key. Then you can get stuff done. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah, we could set up a meeting. And part of what I've been doing, I did um, share the watershed implementation plans contract with the TJPDC for this year as there were a few changes. But part of what I've been working really hard to do is kind of compile a lot of information on the different grants that are available and their deadlines and the eligible projects so that we can share that with each locality and so that they're aware of when these deadlines are happening. But I think that you're spot on on there needs to be increased coordination around these projects and what regional projects we might want to take on um, in later years or upcoming from these many funding sources. And one other thing that I wanted to mention as part of the watershed implementation plans contract is that um, Part of the work that I can do is uh, support the updates of the comprehensive plans that I know is occurring in many localities to um, include information in the environmental sections on best management practices, the watershed implementation plan. And I know that we just touched on sort of the importance of the Rivanna River to this region as well. I'm sure that could be something that's included there. So feel free to reach out to me if there's anything that you need support on in that way. And Lonnie, I believe, has his hands up. Yes, um, because TJPDC um, also worked on the TMDL. Um, I think it's um, one thing I, I've I've asked for for a while that I think would be useful to localities is a BMP manual, um, so that all the localities know all the best management practices, both urban and and rural, that could be could be used in their their areas. Um, I think compiling that is something you know. I think TJPDC has already done a lot of that work with the TMDL. Yeah. Um, I think combining that with an update, um, I've long thought that um, before the storm, as Ann mentioned, is an excellent guide. Um, and I think combining that with an update to that guide, I think a, a new release before the storm guide that could be released to the public as a, here's some great best management practices that, you know, could people could be adopting and using their localities and that could be provided to staff in the various localities is so that people have an educational guide when that was first produced a lot of those practices in that guide were, were new and revolutionary and now a lot of them are standard so it really helped drive a lot of um, changes to the way that um, you know stormwater was managed in, in urban areas particularly in Charlottesville and Albemarle yeah. um, it also included policy recommendations um, based upon enabled legislation. And, and I think another thing that we, we definitely need is a, a manual of, for localities of what, um, what policy legislation can be adopted by localities. I think staff spins their wheels a, a, a lot of time um, each time you know something comes up, I know we had a recent effort in Albemarle County for rural stream health and a lot of the time that staff spent was just trying to figure out what the state allowed us to do. Hmm. Um, so, you know, having a definitive list, like here's the policies that localities can adopt if they want to, that's, that would be a very important 
um, document okay. you have. I'm sure we can work with DEQ to sort of define that. That's a great idea. Thank you very much. This has been great. Uh, so other, are there folks who would support a combination of the snapshot uh, update combined with discussing some topics at a round table and which may or may not be combined with the uh, conference in September as a place for our staff to begin? Or were there other topics of those four recommendations that jumped out at you more? And this is Tom. Happy to part. Hmm. Go ahead. I, I was just saying I, I'm happy to participate in the roundtable. Um, I don't have. I mean, I think that'll be a really good forum under which we can delve deeper into more issues and get some more feedback. And uh, I would certainly be be very interested in participating in that. Very good. I think that while this, the uh, staff people, I think, were very supportive of that, we had a really hard time for the last three years getting them to attend. So I think there needs to be, if we're going to succeed, there needs to be a commitment on the part of the electeds in each jurisdiction to really share with their staff people how important it is that they do take a few hours to, to lend their expertise to others, uh, because it'd be really nice to have 50 people in the room, all with something to say. And then we certainly can have an outside presentation or something, but it's really important that we we uh, help each other along and being able to have jurisdictions learning from the successes and the errors of others to save them the same fate is is really important. I know it seems Albemarle has been intent on making all the same mistakes that Fairfax made 30 years ago, and probably other jurisdictions are trying to do what we're doing now, and so they will end up with the same problems we have. And, so um, we all try to learn and try to do better. But uh, I'm really invigorated by all this information and by the comments today and look forward to seeing everybody in person. And we may just have to get together in person beforehand if, uh, if there are things that we need to help Isabella with during the summer. I will suggest that if any regarding this historic timeline that was the Noose River example, I would encourage each of you to think of partners in your areas who already have accomplished this, who we could call upon to share their information and therefore have that particular element be much less research and much more doing and get us speedily along to to the next phase. And just one thing that I think we're always struggling with is we in Amaral County, we have had lots of donations of property and there are five different places along the Ravana from Brook Hill right under the 29 bridge to Buck Island, which is the Flavana County border, all given to the county for the express purpose of put in and take out. And we have not managed to accumulate the $500,000 required to do all five of them. I mean, it's not each, it's total. So those sort of recreational access funds, if anybody has any great information about that, I would sure love to hear about it because I know there's money out there. I keep hearing about other communities that are having great successes and the grant world is very challenging. You know, when you finally find one, you find out the closing date is in 10 days, which makes you crazy. So um, all, all hands on deck, I think would really help all of us to be able to participate better. And I'm really glad for Jason's expertise to be able to help us with that big obstacle. So um, Isabella, were there other things we needed to do? to um, meet the end of your agenda. That's okay. the end of it for now, yeah. Any other questions to leave for staff to solve another day or any other comments anybody wants to share with us? Wow, I am really grateful. This has been fun. I'll tell you, even though I love seeing people in person, having people not have to drive 100 miles. I mean, Steve's a long way up the road. So it's really great to be able to do this. And maybe we do this more often and meet quarterly in person, and then we get to do a whole lot more. Lonnie, is your hand up new or old? It, it was old. I just forgot to take it. Okay, off. very Thanks. good. 
All right, anybody else have any parting shots? All right, well, thank you everyone. And as you can tell, this is a, a passion of mine and I, and I know it's a passion of all of yours as well. So we will all make great progress working together. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you bye-bye. Thank you all for your thank feedback. You. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Take care, everyone.